The ideas expressed in the following presentations are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of ACI or its committees. ACI web sessions are recorded at ACI conventions or other concrete industry events and will be made available for viewing free of charge for one week. Thereafter, they will be archived on the ACI website or added to ACI's online CEU program, depending on their content. There we go. With respect to the durability work that we have done in recent times as the Concrete Institute of Australia, a lot of it was born out of the fact that in our country we have a number of different uh, Australian standards and codes for concrete. We've listed a few of them up here up on the screen, but you can see that they're, they're split up into structural type of concrete codes and material based concrete codes. Now those different types of codes are all very good in their own right. But one of the problems that we have from a durability perspective is that there's a lot of inconsistencies in those particular standards. Um, the materials codes, for example, don't really address construction quality as a means of making sure that we're getting good durability. And they do lack uh, a considerable amount of guidance on the various options that you can use for different types of materials to achieve a durability outcome. From a structural code perspective, there's a number of issues there that we've identified. Um, number one, uh, the exposure classifications and the specifications for each of those different types of structures, uh, structures you can see up here on the board, are very different. And that really does lie in the area where our, our durability committee decided we needed to address some of these uh, extreme inconsistency issues. And so about seven years ago, our durability committee got together and determine the best way to address this. The first port of call was to, uh, to, to talk to our members, talk to the industry in Australia. And after a uh, road show around the country, they managed to get together all that uh, information, managed to get together a, a posse of the uh, experts in durability in our country and also from New Zealand. And they came up with the idea of putting together seven different documents. And we call them our Z7 durability recommended practice suites, or suite of documents. And there are seven of these in which our committee have been working on over the years. Some are already produced, some are close to being uh, finalised, and, uh, and one in particular is yet to be started, but I'll explain a little bit about that as we go on. The first one that we've put together is a, is a document called Durability Planning. We call it Z701. And the main reason that this was the first document we put together, it was established that realistically at the end of the day specifiers needed something that they could start a durability specification with. And durability planning is something that in Australia some of our leading experts have got themselves more involved in. We have some consulting groups now who specify pretty much specifically in durability planning. As a result of that, we've now put together a, a, a rather fulsome document and this really does let the, uh, the owner identify in what areas and in what regards are they going to have to be extremely diligent when it comes to durability. Now this particular document has been out in our marketplace for a little while. Um, I might get uh, Jimmy, if he hasn't already, to, to hand out a, a copy of that. Now if you do see these documents coming around the, the room in Australia, we like to say they're like a boomerang. It means they've got to come back to me. So if, uh, if you can make sure that they do the round trip and end up back at the front here, that'd be fabulous. But we've also noticed that this particular document, Z701, is being looked at from the international market as well. Uh, a couple of years ago, Doug Hooten was in Australia for our, uh, our biennial conference, and when Doug became aware of this particular document, he took copies back for ACI 201 to have a look at. And uh, I'm hoping to sit on their durability committee meeting tomorrow and provide a bit more of an update on what we're doing with our other documents. So in this particular document, I won't obviously go through it all in detail, but one particular area that we identified, or that the durability committee identified needed some work, was clarifying what the definition of service life was. Going back to those inconsistencies in our Australian codes and standards, there's a multitude of different definitions for design life, there's service life, in-service life, in-service design life. So if you're looking at one particular standard for a specification, you can open up the next one and have two completely definitions of what we're trying to do when it comes to service life. 
So in this particular document, we have condensed that so that we have a consistent view on what we view to be a definition for service life in our industry. The other area that we're looking at, which is a, a rather new concept in particular in, in, in Australian codes, is the concept of using reliability in design. And in this particular document, we do go into it in a fair bit of detail, but the concept is really taken from the FIB model code 2010. And you'll see that there will be some references to FIB and some European codes as we go through the presentation. But we have certainly uh, looked at what they're doing in Europe and with FIB, and I know that the model code code uh, at the moment is being reviewed for, uh, for, for another change in 2020 and this will be another area in which the model code will be looked at and obviously we will then look at that from our perspective with, uh, with durability planning. The next document that we will look to put out, and this one is yet to be uh, released but it's not far away, is to do with exposure classification and I'm quite sure around the world specification of exposure classification is always something that can be rather controversial. What we've found in our codes, again, is uh, a great deal of inconsistency in the way that we look at exposure classifications and where we might look at designing for particular conditions or, or expectations. And so what we want to do, or what our durability committee has done, is again they've modelled uh, exposure classifications based on European codes, but also looked at some other international codes that are around, just to have a look at a way in which we can make it a lot easier for specifiers in particular to be able to look at what conditions they're going to expect in what parts of the country. So generally in Australian codes, we do cover uh, a number of those areas that are up here on the screen. Now obviously for things with respect to carbonation, chlorides, uh, structures that are going to be found in, in marine environments and so forth. But we've looked at adding uh, some new classifications that haven't necessarily been looked at before in Australia. We've also been talking to our friends in New Zealand about what they may need to, uh, to look at. And we're also looking at some other areas at the moment where our committee haven't entirely decided on where they're going to head, in particular uh, with reference to alkali silica reaction, which is, or has been quite a big issue in Australia, and also uh, DEF, which again is a, a major international issue, but something that hasn't really been discussed in great detail in Australia. So traditionally in our country we've looked at three different types of exposure conditions. That being the, the most popular, which is a temperate condition. Most of our population live on the east coast or down around the bottom of the south of Australia and out in the west. And you can see, hopefully you can see it up here on the screen, those green areas really do replicate where the majority of our population live in that country. They're the temperate areas. They're the nicer places to live in in terms of the, uh, the, the climate. The yellow in the middle has always been the arid environment. There's not a lot of construction that goes on in those areas, but there is a great deal of mining. And so it is important from an exposure classification than any structures being built in those areas understand what is required in respect to durability. And then the blue area, that's the tropical area. And so Northern Territory, North Queensland, far North Queensland tend to be in the tropics and there's a lot of rain, a lot of humidity in those particular areas. One of the things that we don't normally classify though is if you've got something that is always going to be, be wet. So it doesn't matter whether you've got a marine structure in a temperate area or in a, uh, or in a tropical area, you're probably not going to find too many marine structures in the arid area. If you've got structures in those particular places, it doesn't matter whether it's temper temperate or tropical, it's always wet. And so we've included a new classification along those lines to match that. And so whilst we've changed the nomenclature with respect to the classifications, we generally consider the three typical uh, exposure areas in Australia, but we've added the wet and really dry scenario. But what we've also looked at including is structures where the exposure within that particular structure is going to cause some durability issue. Tunnels, for example, there's a lot of carbon dioxide, a lot of carbon monoxide in those particular environments within the structure. Now again, it doesn't matter whether it's in a temperate area, tropical area, or in an arid area, within that little exposure area itself, within that confined area, you've got its own little climate and you've got different conditions that you've got to deal with. And so the exposure classification document is going to look at dealing with all those particular different types of areas. One area that we've also added, which isn't included in, in any Australian standards at the moment, is when there is water migration. And so in particular we're looking at um, areas related to water pre penetration. So there's a number of different areas in which we're, we're looking at that. Uh, the Durability Committee is considered 
considered a number of different options and all of this is included in that particular document. Now the next document we call is uh, deemed to comply requirements and we call that one Z703. And the deemed to comply requirements is the document I referred to before as not having started yet. And the reason it hasn't started yet is we have to wait until all our other documents are completed so that we can have a consistent document that refers to all of the other durability documentation that we're putting together. Now, I'm not sure whether people were in the uh, mini Rylam session this morning and, and heard Mark Alexander's presentation on the uh, performance-based specifications for control of concrete durability. And I found that there was a, a bit of synergy in what Mark was talking about this morning with this particular document and the, the need for this document. Mark was talking about the fact that we can't just rely on strength in a specification to deal with all the aspects that we need to get out of the concrete, in particular durability. And so this particular document is going to look at all the various inputs that a specifier is going to put into place. What sort of design life do we need? What are the exposure classifications that, uh, or what, what's the exposure that the, uh, the concrete structure is going to be exposed to? What sort of reliability do we need out of that particular structure? And then from there, our outputs are that we're going to be able to put together a specification that takes into play all the other documents that we've, we've used into one area and look at it from a point of, well, okay, now I can determine my cover, I can determine what sort of cement I'm going to utilise, I can look at supplementary cementitious materials, how am I going to use those in, in a blend with various, uh, with, with general purpose cement or general Portland cement, what strengths do I need, but with that what sort of water cement ratio am I going to need, what sort of steel am I going to use. Because in that instance, we may be looking at using galvanised steel instead of, instead of traditional steel reinforcement just to be, getting, uh, to be getting the durability that we require. So this document is going to be vitally important to the suite. As I mentioned before, we need to wait until we've completed the others before we can, uh, we can finalise that. Z74 is about good practice. And this takes us right through from the design process to the construction process and through the concrete supply process. It's a very detailed document. So that's, uh, that is one document that's doing the rounds at the moment. And, and so please have a good look when it gets to you. And this particular document, as I said, covers all the facets. I'm just going to take you through three examples that you'll find within there, looking at each of those particular areas of design, construction and supply. And the first one is design. So if we're designing for cover, traditionally, I know from, from our uh, Australian codes, what we will look at doing is we'll, we'll specify a certain cover in a certain exposure classification doesn't always mean that that is what's required. So in this area, we're not just specifying cover to steel, but we're also specifying the tolerances that might be allowed. We're looking at the key factors that might be required to achieve that cover. And when we're talking about that, we're talking about the specification requirements. What sort of bar chairs do we need? You know, what sort of, what, in, in which ways are we going to be certain that we're going to achieve that cover on site? And then quality assurance checks that go into the specification that cover the before and after when concrete is poured. And so rather than just going to the old days and saying we need 30 mil cover, we're going to be looking at a fulsome design specification. From a construction perspective, just as an example of, of an area that we've covered in this document, we look at bleed. And we know that bleed water can cause issues when we've got too little bleed, we can end up with plastic shrinkage. If we've got too much, we can end up with plastic settlement. What we want to be able to do is get across to the contractor what is required from a bleed perspective and the impact that too little or too much bleed can actually have on the durability of our, docu of our particular product. And then the third one is concrete supply. And in this instance, we can look at the water that might be used in the actual concrete supply itself. And we can consider dealing this from a, a water cement ratio perspective, specifying a maximum requirement, targeting it to be, uh, when we're talking about the water cement ratio, targeting it to be 0 0.02 below what the maximum is, and then from there controlling the batching weights. And that's where we look at the water in the supply of the aggregates and how much water is actually still on those aggregates when they're being weighed and when they're used in, uh, in practice. So I better zip through the rest of it now. Z705 is our durability modelling document and this one's proved to be the hardest one to put together so far. 
because we put together all our experts in Australia and they all had different interpretations of all the various different types of models that they brought to the table. And so it's taken a while to get some consensus on this, but the three areas that our, our group have looked at in this area are chloride diffusion, carbonation rate and the propagation period. And so this is work in progress still, but it's certainly proving to be a, uh, not just a, a difficult conversation, but it's been a very, very uh, productive and worthwhile one and we're going to end up with a uh, very useful document. Crack control and assessment is our Z76 document. This one is just about completed and we're hoping to have that out in the marketplace in, uh, in, in just a month or so. And this has been uh, drafted primarily by one of the preeminent experts in, uh, in concrete cracking design uh, and control in Australia, um, who's a, a prominent member also of ACI here uh, from Australia, uh, Professor Ian Gilbert. And so Professor Gilbert's work in this has just been completely invaluable and uh, we, we very much appreciate all the work he's done on that. But we We've also utilised some European codes and guidelines in this particular document, particularly when it comes to thermal strain. And so this document, again, is going to be a very useful one in the Australian market and hopefully in the global market when it comes to understanding the importance of crack control and how we can prevent excessive cracking occurring from a durability perspective. And then the final one that we've put together, and this one is out in the marketplace, I didn't have a copy with me uh, on this trip, is durability tests. And this is a really good example of where inconsistency in our standards has caused confusion in our marketplace. One in particular is water, water sorptivity and absorption testing. In Australia we have nine different tests that can be specified through those various standards that you saw before. And in fact I think they've actually left off one of them. Um, in my old days I used to be involved with the Concrete Pipe Association in Australia and there's a water absorption test in there that I don't think was actually considered in this particular document as well. So let's make it ten. And as a result our committee were able to get that down to two water absorption and sorptivity tests that they thought were appropriate for the industry. One is called a VPV test that uh, one of our DOTs in Australia use, Vic Rhodes, and has been found to be a, an extremely effective test. And the other one is an old English sorptivity test. Um, for those of you familiar with Taywood Engineering, um, you may remember that uh, they had a, a, a very useful sorptivity test that's been utilised in a lot of specifications in Australia. What we've done is we've used that with a version of an ASTM test uh, which is a little bit different because the ASTM version uh, re re relies on drying of the specimen in the lab rather than in an oven and it was felt that that was more appropriate and applicable to Australian conditions. So there you have it. We've got seven documents on, on durability that I think uh, are going to be extremely useful. Well, they're certainly going to be extremely useful in the Australian market. We certainly hope that they might end up being useful in the international market as well. As I mentioned before, ASI 201 has already seen our durability planning document and think that it's uh, an extremely good uh, publication and we're hoping that we might be able to provide some, uh, some useful information not just to ACI's durability committee but uh, on, a, on a global perspective. So thank you for your time.